pleasure for me to be here. I came in this morning, and I'm actually having a 24-hour tour of Sydney, which is going to consist of this room, the swimming pool, and the airport. So I hope to have the opportunity to come back. You know, John, fortunately, you touched on some uh, literature and choosing levels and selecting levels and where we may uh, make this decision to do a selective fusion versus fusing both curves, I think was helpful. And I'm not going to really get into that because I think there are a lot of unanswered questions still, um, as both you and Jim have pointed out. So I'll try to stick with what we do know and uh, talk about uh, the factors to consider when dealing with double major curves. And one of the things we uh, assess when looking at patients is their maturity and, and how they present, whether their curves are progressive or the potential for curve progression uh, based on uh, skeletal maturity. And if they're mature, they have a, a double curve, you may consider a selective fusion versus if they have significant growth remaining, where you may be more likely to address both curvatures. I think uh, in terms of the radiographic factors, John's already discussed the Lenke criteria, which is a start, but it's not ideal by any means in, in helping us uh, to determine fusion levels and, again, which curves we may uh, be able to avoid fusing. Uh, but we certainly, all of us, look at the clinical features, the shoulders, uh, waistline, rotational prominences, and I think, uh, you know, if the left shoulder's up, I tend to go a little higher for those patients. And uh, I might consider doing a selective fusion in patients in whom uh, a, a small, there's not in, uh, significant uh, deformity uh, in the lumbar region. Another thing that we talked about today was cosmesis and uh, what the patient's perception of their uh, disease is or their disorder is. And you, we can look at radiographic features, we can look at uh, natural history and the uh, potential for uh, disc degeneration. But this is also a psychological uh, disorder, and I think we've looked at a little bit of that with the, uh, this uh, body image disturbance questionnaire, which I think helps us get a better understanding of what these kids are going through to some extent. And so I think it's important in decision making to understand the goals of the patient and, and their family in particular and having the discussions that we've talked about today. What about leaving some of these alone? Uh, even significant curves uh, in an, a skeletally mature patient who's well balanced, who doesn't have a problem with the way they look. Uh, yes, we have to consider the natural history, but some of these patients uh, we, we certainly have the option of observing, particularly if they're not interested in surgery. And then we can deal with the, 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 the late problems later because fusing to L3 or L4 now doesn't necessarily allow them to avoid an operation later. In fact, probably many of them will come to a a, a long fusion to the sacrum. So there are a lot of unanswered questions, but I did want to throw in this slide about body image disturbance, and this is a questionnaire that we validated and have presented at the SRS, and we've submitted it for publication just the other day. But there's some free text areas of this uh, questionnaire, and, and this questionnaire doesn't just look at self-image as the SRS questionnaire does. It looks at how patients modify their behavior and their activities as a result of their perception and of their body image. It's called body image disturbance. So uh, it, this one 18-year-old boy, it embarrasses, it embarrasses me to take off my shirt. I am, I am looked at as, as a freak and as an unattractive person. Uh, and you can read some of the other responses. So I think that uh, getting an under, understanding of how these kids uh, perceive their uh, deformity is important. And what we found in a follow-up to the original validation study is that body image disturbance in these kids improves. They, they lose their, their body image disturbance with surgery. So it's a psychological disorder as much as a, uh, a structural radiographic problem. Uh, the Lenke criteria are here, and I'll focus today on Lenke 3, 4, and 6 curves and anti one C's, and those that they sort of all, all three, all four here are shown. The one on the right, the lanky one C, there's a significant lumbar curve of 48 degrees, but this is flexible. So should we be fusing those curves or not? Uh, I don't really have the answer, but I think we can certainly uh, consider not fusing the lumbar curve in a lot of those one C's, but also in some of the other, what has been radiographically perceived as a structural curve. 
So we, we look at the prominences, as I've already said. We look at waistline asymmetry, and we want to pay attention to the shoulders. If the left shoulder is level uh, or, or higher, I, I would just grab one or two extra vertebra and compress down on that left upper side. Um, we've talked about skeletal maturity already. So how do we get the job done, and what is that job that we want to get done? And that is to achieve balanced correction, preserve as many motion segments as possible, improve or preserve kyphosis. We know that, and I'll talk about this tomorrow, that longer fusions are associated with hypokyphosis. I think horizontalizing the LIV is important, and we don't, we've talked about disc wedging. I don't know that we really have the answers, but we certainly uh, try to achieve those things in surgery. And we want to minimize complications and maintain the junctions for as long as possible, and I think some of that is going to be genetic. And uh, hopefully Jim and his group will give us answers to that soon that, so that we can use that clinically. In terms of the anchors, which is uh, how we really are uh, workhorses for getting the job done, how many screws to use, what should the anchor density be? Well, at a minimum, I think four above, four below, and, and put screws at the apex to get uh, apical control for derotation. And I think the, the screw strategies are based on your experience and uh, uh, you know, the economics uh, as well, which play an increasingly important role even in the good old USA. Um, the polyaxial screws I typically use at the end of constructs and then we use the uniplanar screws to, to have a more rigid control of the apex. But I really know that uh, from my own experience and from the literature that hybrid constructs uh, do a really nice job, particularly for these widely deviated apices. This is a girl from Taiwan that came to me about 10 years ago. And uh, we addressed this with uh, screws and sublaminar wires. It pulled it over very nicely. Actually, at that time, we did a, uh, I believe we did a thoracoplasty on her. And, uh, and you know, with a very nice result. So in terms of screw placement, uh, you know, the more screws you place, the greater time it takes, the more potential for complications and blood loss. So we looked at our first uh, 96 cases uh, to assess the learning curve and found that over time we were putting more and more screws in, and maybe that was because we could. But certainly there's been a trend amongst our colleagues around the world to use more screws. And uh, I, I don't know that that's necessarily better. Uh, but we got better at putting them in. It took less time. If you take the overall operative time divided by the number of screws placed, that's what these numbers are. Uh, over the course of time, we just got better at it, and the overall operative time went to uh, decrease significantly as well during the course of the, that series. And the percent curve correction increased as the anchor density increased as well, and, and a number of authors have shown that. Um, so the only thing I want you to take away from this uh, table is that the rate of complications was relatively flat with a, a slight uptick in the second and third quartiles of patients that we did. But basically, we can put these screws in safely. But the question is, is, is this result not as good as a similar patient, similar curve magnitude, but with a much higher screw density? I mean, it took the same amount of time. but. Um, is this necessarily better? There's a few degrees of, of improvement in coronal plane correction, but, um, but we've made the thoracic spine very flat with all those screws. Is there a pointer here? Middle one. Okay, thanks. So I don't know that that's, that's any better, but it's certainly a lot of screws. Um, other things that we think about when dealing with these curves or any other curves for that matter is the stiffness of the rod material. We've been using cold walk chrome, and I think that rail rod that we saw is probably a very good option for some curves, and it, it helps m obtain and then maintain correction in the coronal and especially the sagittal pl pain, uh, plane, particularly for long fusions, because the longer the fusion, the more likely that the uh, kyphosis will flatten out, and, and we found that in a multivariate analysis that I'll talk about tomorrow. And perhaps there are better imaging characteristics and, and maybe resistance to infection uh, topics that were brought up this morning uh, over stainless steel, certainly for titanium and perhaps cobalt chrome. Uh, we use a differential rod contouring technique. I'll show a picture or two of that, do the derotation maneuvers. And then I use compression distraction to level 
uh, the lowest instrumented verte vertebra, and um, distraction intersegmentally on the concave side to improve uh, kyphosis. Uh, we all know about the rod stiffness, cobalt chrome being up here, and for a 5.5 millimeter rod, in terms of stiffness compared to titanium here. So this is a slide uh, that Peter Newton gave me, and this is the concept of differential rod contouring in which the concave rod is, is more high, sort of contoured into more kyphosis to pull this side out and achieve kyphosis, and then the second rod is less uh, contoured in order to uh, help with the derotation effect, and I'll show that 